when I ask people, what place do you want to see most in the world? No one answers with the place that's in the ocean. All the places that I still really want to see are offshore. If I ask you to imagine the seabed 40 miles offshore, what do you see in your mind? Do you see a rather barren place where little life is visible? Much of the offshore environment does look this way. But there are other places, places where life is very visible. This, 40 miles offshore of the Tugela River on our east coast, is one of the most memorable places that I have visited. I've seen more than 500 places on the seafloor. I'm a marine scientist. My name is Kerry Sink. There isn't a captain alive who does not quiver when he sees the name Sink on his passenger list. <laughs> I love to go to sea. And this evening, I'm going to share with you some of the places in my journey. This is my world. At the tip of this great African continent, we have three oceans, the Atlantic, the Indian, and the Southern Ocean. And on our Atlantic side, we have this wide continental shelf. Where that shelf changes angle and drops down steeply into the deep sea, that's called the shelf edge or continental margin. I like to call it the great underwater escarpment. And many of my most special places, just like that forest of sea fans on the Tugela shelf edge, lie on the great escarpment. This evening, I'm going to share with you some of the special places. Not the shallow coral reefs and beautiful kelp forests some of you know, but the places that have taken four or five scuba cylinders to breathe 100 meter under the water. The places that I've been by underwater drone, and the places that I've seen through the window of a yellow submarine. My personal journey has been one of increasing depth. And these are two central characters in my story. The late Peter Tim, Trimex diver, and Jesse the coelacanth. Coelacanths have long held secrets of the sea. I think they still do. They were abundant in the fossil record in all kinds of forms and in many environments, but considered extinct until in 1938, a trawler caught a coelacanth off the South African coast. The scientist who reported this described it like finding a living dinosaur. And 60 years later, this diver, his discovery of three coelacanths in Isimangaliso, a Zulu word for miracle and wonder, it sparked a new research program. So much like that initial discovery that put South African marine science on the map, scientists like me got opportunities to have access to deep water research tools and time at sea. And in the last 17 years, I have been mapping and classifying the ecosystems in our ocean space. It's time for me to share some of them with you. Jesse and 30 other coelacanths, each recognized by their individual spot patterns, lives here in the submarine canyons that cut into that continental shelf edge at Sedwana Bay on South Africa's east coast. It was here that I first met this great escarpment, and Peter Tim took me to go and peer over its edge for the first time. Later, after a lot of training, he took me over that edge into a new world. When you swim over the edge of this escarpment, it's like being able to fly slowly down the slopes of a mountain and you descend through bands of life, each of them with different animals in different depth zones. Last year, I traversed this great escarpment for 30 days. And one of the places I really wanted to go and see was a place where this fish, our kingclip, one of our most valuable seafood species, gathers to spawn. These fish are drummers. They call to each other across the ocean. 
and then they congregate, aggregating together in this one tiny space. And I had no idea what would I find when I got there. But what I can tell you is it didn't look like this. I have trouble sleeping at night on the sea because I have fear of missing out, FOMO. I love to watch the echo sounder. That echo sounder constantly charts the underwater terrain. And I love to see that seascape below me as I'm sailing through the ocean. When I got here, I was amazed. The continental shelf wave drops sharply all the way to 700 meters. And then suddenly, like this needle rising up two, 300 meters high is this wall. And this long, narrow ridge, it extends for 40 kilometers. And the king clip gather here in this special place. You can see on the echo sound of all those little blue dots, that is a cloud of life. And when we put our cameras down, we were not disappointed. The seabed is rich and diverse. It's different in different places. In Protea Canyon, you have a lawn made of polychaete worms interspersed with giant cup sponges. In this single image from 500 meters on our south coast, I can see more than 50 species. I've been studying the language of the seabed since I was little. From six, my brother took me snorkeling along the pier where I learned to read the tiny footprints of starfish and other animals. I was just drawn in by the detail, the intricacies, and the mysteries. When I first saw these animals, the kind of zigzag dark things on the seafloor, not the two red lasers, my student said to me, Kerry, what are those? And it was, it was difficult because I had to tell them I had no idea what group of animals they belonged to. I joked with them that I thought a Rastafarian had lost his dreadlocks on the seafloor. It was the best I could do. But now I know that these are single-celled animals uh, called forams or foraminiferans, and they secrete shells. But what I was amazed to learn when, when I looked this up is that these animals are currently, like the coelacanth was, reported as extinct. And I need to report that they're very very much alive and abundant on our outer shelf. We encounter fascinating species like this tilefish, who carries each and every piece of shell fragment and rubble to build a home complete with front door. It took Peter Tim 30 dives to show me this fish. He kind of first described it to me, but it took us a long time to see it because it shoots into its hole. We also find valuable species. This gelatinous network of tube has produced the most effective compound ever tested against cancer. It only lives in South Africa's ocean. Even in the darkest, muddiest parts of the ocean floor, there is life. One of the most fascinating specimens I encountered was this one. And I found it not in the field, but rather in the South African Museum. And it was misclassified. It was in the worm section of the museum. And you can see how someone might think it was a network of worm tubes. But it's a lattice of coral. And what astounded me about this coral was its label. The label of this coral read 926 meters. When I worked out that we had deep water corals 926 meters under the sea, I knew that we had to see them. And this took us more than 10 years. First, just glimpses a child's bank on the Atlantic side, and then later, the cigarette corals, as we call them, an undescribed species on our east coast. And I'm still working at seeing those one kilometer down mounds that stand 70 meters high off our seabed. You get different types of corals, and each of them make ecosystems as different from one another as a pine forest and a tropical forest. These are lace corals, and they only occur in a very small section of our shelf edge. They're very slow growing, just like our black corals. These ones also from the Tugela shelf edge. 
the oldest black coral ever recorded is 4,000 years old. One can only imagine what a tree such as this might have witnessed in 4,000 years. And what's great for scientists is that corals record in their details, like a tree almost. They record the details of our climate past and of conditions in the ocean. So that's very valuable for science. We also have soft corals in the ocean. And when you look closely, you find life within life. And if you look very closely, you will see the eyes of future fish in the arms of the soft corals. Corals make nursery habitats, and nursery areas are special places. I'm not only a marine scientist, but I'm also a mother. And the hardest thing of being a marine scientist mother is that you go to sea for long periods. And the first time that I was going to sea for a month, and I had to say goodbye to my little boy, was explaining to him at age three why, why I study the seabed. And he understood. He said to me, Mom, if you don't look after the seabed, the fish will have nowhere to sleep. <laughs> we have pressures in our offshore environment. South Africa has a hundred year old trawl fishery, and that fishery is important for providing foods, food, and jobs. That's the South African hake, one of our key target species. We're still learning about how the seabed responds in these sandy slopes where most of this activity takes place. But we know the impact on our special places. Cold water corals, that matrix, that complex three-dimensional lattice is broken and fish have nowhere to hide from predators and, and lose their homes. Such ecosystems do not recover overnight, if ever. South Africa also has mining in the seascape, and we know from studies on the impacts of diamond mining that the deeper you go, the longer the recovery times for the seafloor. A good scientist knows what she doesn't know. And I don't know the impacts of this activity on that great escarpment and beyond. Globally, there is great interest in seabed minerals and the emerging technology to mine kilometers under the sea is impressive. It is, however, unlikely to be compatible with the special places in the ocean. Many countries are building their ocean economies and many countries like South Africa have oil and gas development as a key aspect of that. We have 30 new wellheads planned for the next 10 years. When good industry practice is followed and special places are avoided, the impacts of this drilling on the seabed is localized. We can have coexistence. If we apply the deep knowledge that we have, and if we look after the special places in the ocean, it's possible for the ocean to be shared. We know what to do. We need to establish protected areas in the sea, like Kruger National Parks and Yellowstones for the ocean space. At present, on land, 8% of South Africa's land is protected. In our ocean space, 0.4% is protected. You can barely see it there. I'm gonna say that again. 0.4% of our ocean space is protected. South Africa has committed to expanding this protection to 5% of the ocean. And in 2016, 22 proposed new marine protected areas were released for public comment. These protected areas can help build resilience, resilience against climate change, resilience against pressures and they can help us to secure the last pieces of ecosystems like this, which have been impacted over 95% of their total extent. We also need to manage the most productive areas in our ocean. That little blue area on the map, that represents about 5% of our ocean space. 
but 90% of our seafood is caught in that 5% of the ocean. We need to look after that. 90% of our seafood in just 5% of the ocean. We need to make sure that as we grow our ocean economies and expand and diversify ocean activities, food and jobs provided by the fishing industry are maintained. Fish is a renewable resource. If we look after these areas, we can fish forever. We lost the opportunity to get most of our protein from wild, antibiotic-free sources on land a long time ago, and we need to ensure that we maintain these opportunities into the future. The last thing we need to do is to deepen our understanding of how to protect and manage the ocean. This beautiful undersea mountain or sea mount is within one of our proposed protected areas. But in the back, you can see these amazing canyon features. And there are little pits or pockmarks on the sea floor, which are actually gas escape features. South Africa has these amazing communities that live around these gas features. These animals defy the food chains of my biology teachers, all of whom which were powered by sunlight. Such chemically powered ecosystems have great potential for biotechnology. We need to secure our ocean spaces. We can do this if we protect, if we manage. And through all of your choices, if you eat seafood, if you use oil and gas, if you love diamonds, if you love your cell phone and other emerging new technologies that demand ocean minerals, your choices play a role in the health of our oceans. All of the special places that I shared with you this evening are within these proposed protected areas. I haven't seen the last piece of Benguela untrolled shelf edge on our west coast. Myself and other scientists need to see this to be able to understand and detect change and advise on coping with change. But there's one place that I want to see more, way up on the bucket list, in the heart of the diamond mining area, at 120 meters, there lies on the floor a fossilized yellow wood forest. I read about it in a geological journal, and there's some grainy black and white pictures which shows the trunks of these trees, and on the trunks are corals. Fossilized trees and rocks tell a story of our climate past, and I think you'll agree that there was never a more important place to understand our climate past, so we can predict and change our climate future. I want to see this place and tell its story. And there's one more thing that I want to see. This is my intern, Luther, Great Oceans. I want to see Luther complete his studies. I want to see all my students and the next generation of scientists discover and describe new species and new ecosystems. I want to see future generations look after the seabed so that the fish will always have somewhere to sleep. Thank you. <laughs>